Now I would like to turn to our speaker tonight, Dr. Leonard Peikoff. Dr. Peikoff was born in Winnipeg, Canada, but is now an American citizen. He received his degrees in philosophy from New York University in New York. And for 30 years, Dr. Peikoff followed and studied the objectivist philosophy of Ayn Rand until her death in 1982. As her intellectual heir, Dr. Peikoff has edited her lectures and manuscripts, philosophical and literary, and he has presented her works for publication. He is the author of Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, and The Ominous Parallels. He has edited journals such as The Ayn Rand Letter and The Objectivist, and he has written articles on Plato, Aristotle, Ayn Rand, and other philosophical subjects. He has been interviewed on dozens of newspapers and hundreds of radio and television shows. And I am pleased to announce that he is currently the host of a daily afternoon radio call-in talk show in Los Angeles on KIEV 870 AM. Professor Dr. Peikoff has taught at the Polytechnic Institute, the University of Denver, Monmouth College, New York University, Long Island University, and Hunter College. He has been a lecturer all across the United States and Canada and has been an appreciated guest at the Ford Hall Forum since 1982. He has once again come back to us, carrying on the tradition started by Ayn Rand. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Leonard Peikoff, who will tonight discuss a philosopher's view of the O.J. Simpson verdict. Dr. Peikoff. Thank you, Jeffrey. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please don't feel that Peikoff is too late. He should have given this speech last year. Because the OJ case will never date, not even if OJ himself should one day confess. Fifty years from now, the subject will still be bulging with meaning. The O.J. case is what Ayn Rand would call an eternal concrete. It is an event that forever embodies the essence of an era. The verdict, along with what led to it, reveals in stark purity the contradictions of our legal system and of our entire nation. By now, you have heard commentary on this case from everyone, from whites and blacks, active participants and neutral observers, venal scientists and live-in gophers, outraged feminists and mealy-mouthed law professors, upright district attorneys and snake-like defense attorneys, <laughs> and every imaginable species and subsect of journalists. With the whole nation glued to the trial and everybody rushing on to TV or into print to comment, there seems to be only one profession that nobody asked to take part and from whom not one spokesman volunteered. Obviously, because everyone, including the members of that profession, knows that these people, by definition, are irrelevant to life and have zero to say about anything of importance. Uh, you can guess what profession I mean. I'm thinking of the people who teach basic ideas in our colleges, those in the field which long ago was at the top of the intellectual pyramid, the philosophers. This is another piece of evidence of the decline, or more accurately, of the non-existence of philosophy today. The fact is, however, that the O.J. case falls squarely within the domain of philosophy and only of philosophy. Neither the trial nor the verdict can be understood by any other field or profession. I intend to make good on that claim tonight. 
Can you understand the trial without knowing the motivation of the participants, including the jury? What were they all after? What values guided them? It was not an accidental kaleidoscope of whims that we witnessed. The OJ trial was the perfect embodiment of a definite moral code. A simple code and a vicious one, which in some form is preached by every politician and every college professor in the United States. What code? Where did it come from? What has it done to the values bequeathed to us by the Founding Fathers? All that is the domain of philosophy, specifically of ethics. Plus, the participants in the trial had to decide continually whether a given item of evidence or a given conclusion was reasonable. Reasonable. Who or what defines that concept? The law does not. The law takes the concept for granted and simply urges jurors to act as, quote, reasonable men would. Only philosophers study the nature of reason as a means of cognition. Only philosophy defines the proper method of knowledge, the actual steps of being reasonable. Only epistemology the branch of philosophy that studies the nature of knowledge. Only epistemology can tell us what ideas qualify as reasonable. And this, in fact, is how it worked. Epistemology is what guided the lawyers and the jurors at every key point of the trial, as we'll see. So let's start with the ethical issue. The most obvious sign of value judgments is strong emotion. And the evidence of emotion in this case was overwhelming. Many commentators said correctly that the verdict was a triumph of emotion over reason. So what was the dominant emotion of the jurors and of the defense? Narrowly and concretely, it was antagonism toward the Los Angeles police. More broadly, it was hostility toward the establishment as a whole. Emotionally, the leitmotif of the trial and the verdict was clear cut. It was blacks against whites. It was black racism retaliating against what the blacks perceived as white racism. Now, there are many distinguished exceptions to the racist trend among blacks, but unfortunately, these exceptions were not much in evidence in the O.J. case, the obvious exception being the heroic Christopher Darden. Mr. Cochran and the jurors, however, were not any kind of heroes. They were concerned not with the deserts of an individual defendant, but with the lust of a mob. They were concerned not with truth, but with vengeance. The us-them mentality at the trial was truly shocking. The polls showed over and over that most blacks were interpreting the events of the case in a totally different way from that of most whites. We were told repeatedly that blacks had different formative experiences with the police and therefore had their own unique view of the evidence which whites could not understand. Just observe in passing that this claim means that a man's mind, as it develops, gets programmed by factors outside his power so that he can no longer perceive reality as it is, only reality as it appears to him given his programming. Does that sound familiar? What famous philosopher was the first to advance such an idea? But for that we have to wait a few minutes. For now, I just want to state flat out that no amount of experience, not even 50 years of uninterrupted police brutality against blacks, if such had been the truth, could justify or explain a reading of the evidence in this case as favorable to OJ. 
Only a powerful emotion can explain it. What Ayn Rand called the I wish versus the it is. I wish OJ to win regardless of the facts. I wish it to pay them back for Rodney King, for the Ku Klux Klan, for discrimination and prejudice, for police misconduct, for the failure of the politicians to deliver on their egalitarian promises to the ghettos. Only rage can explain the instant verdict without even a pretense of deliberation. The jurors said later that they had ample time during the case to decide, so deliberation was unnecessary. This is open defiance of the judge's instructions and of the legal system, which demands deliberation, like it or not. The refusal to deliberate was, in effect, a form of jury nullification. The jury's brazen speed was a calculated slap at the nation. It was on a par with college blacks around the country, on TV, cheering and jumping on tables after the verdict was delivered while whites gasped or wept in dismay. The same blacks who simultaneously jeered and booed at the TV pictures of the Browns and the Goldmans. To these cheers and jeers, juror and non-juror alike, including the one juror who gave the black power high sign, the operative concepts were not victims or accused, but our skin versus the enemy. The evidence of black racism in this country is now incontestable. The OJ case has made it impossible any longer to evade such facts as voluntary black separatism across our college campuses, or the Million Man Black Brothers Only March, or the Black Studies Departments and the minor Minority Quota Hiring Systems which most young blacks seem to defend. A young black law school graduate who describes himself as, quote, desiring to take part in the progressive fight for justice, unquote, said the following honestly in a letter to New York Magazine, quote, this is right after the trial, it is now obvious that the jury was prejudiced from the beginning and the fears of many concerning an inner city jury's ability to handle a case involving a black celebrity were well founded, unquote. What is the deepest cause of the blacks' rage against the whites? It is not any concrete incident, not Rodney King, not the lynchings in the South, not even slavery. That rage was taught to the blacks by white intellectuals in white colleges using abstract philosophical ideas originated by whites. If you want to understand how benevolent and innocent the blacks in this country really are, even after centuries of slavery, Observe the steps of the process. Observe how long it took the white professors to instigate a race war. First, the white intellectuals had to spend a whole century, 100 years, methodically replacing the ethics of the founding fathers, who stressed the individualist pursuit of happiness. They had to replace it with its opposite. They had to import from Central Europe, I'm not even telling you yet what country, an anti-American code of ethics, which stressed the insignificance of personal happiness, the evil of selfishness, the duty of selfless service to the community, the inspiring virtue of self-sacrifice. By the later 1800s, and not until then, this is after the Civil War had finally freed the blacks and removed the worst mistake from the Constitution. In the very years when blacks were struggling with their first decades of liberty, in those very same years in the late 1800s, white American intellectuals were embarking en masse on a pilgrimage to Germany to absorb the new anti-American morality. 
Then they came home to plant its seeds in every college and church and later bus stop that they could find. Here is a brief sample of the avant-garde white intellectual consensus in the U.S. around 1890. Quote, sacrifice, not self-interest, is the life of the individual, of society, of the nation, says what? Quote, the, this is 1890. Quote, the existing competitive system is thoroughly selfish, says another. That's un, un, unequivocal damnation then. Individualism, quote, is the characteristic of simple barbarism, says a third. And laissez-faire must be replaced by a new conception of the functions of government and consequent enlargement of its powers and the sphere of its operations, unquote. In other words, the Founding Father's version of egoism, a man's right to the pursuit of happiness, is out in favor of the ethics of altruism, placing others above self, with the crowning virtue of sacrifice. The Founding Fathers' individualism is rejected as barbaric in favor of the supremacy of a group, a collective. Laissez-faire capitalism is out to be replaced by big government, statism. It took a hundred years to get to that from Philadelphia uh, at the time of the convention. And then it took the avant-garde another 50 years and the formidable help of John Dewey, who destroyed the American schools for them, to drum the new ethics and politics into the mind of the American public. For all these years, blacks had been working conscientiously to better themselves as individuals, and they were starting to succeed at it. Generations of black leaders, now forgotten, here in the United States, had been working to counteract white racism by endorsing colorblindness. In other words, an individualist society where a person's self-made character and achievements count, but his skin color does not. And in my opinion, this policy was slowly succeeding. I can remember a gradually growing racial amity in the U.S. in the pre-World War II years. But few people before World War II, black or white, realized that the doors to the future were being locked against all the citizens by the emerging group think and state worship. By the 50s, the country had been sufficiently brainwashed by the liberals, or dumbed down is a more accurate description. So events could be speeded up. The debased posterity which the Founding Fathers had feared was now the reality. When the white liberals of the New Left in the 60s came out for LSD and Lenin, the black leaders tragically did an about-face and followed their trend. Increasingly, they decided that the solution of our racial problems is not individualism, but collectivism a new virulent collectivism of and for blacks. And on the premises of the white intellectuals, they were right. Just as altruism leads inevitably to collectivism, so statism leads inevitably to racism. If you have to obtain your identity, your self-esteem, and your government handouts by belonging to some group, then race is the most obvious group to join. Hence the meteoric rise during the 60s of the unmeltable ethnics and the hyphenated Americans, with the white liberals at the head of the stampede fighting to wean the blacks above all others from individualism, egging on every form they could find or create, of black power, black truth, black lib, and black victims. To the liberals, blacks were and still are a means to an end, the end being the destruction of the last vestiges of individualism and then the building up of a totalitarian government. To the liberals, the blacks were nothing but a tactic, 
Since blacks had been real victims once, the country could be manipulated into endorsing statism in their name. The recipe was clear and was clearly announced in the 60s. In the name of justice to the one-time slaves, more welfare measures, more laws, more bureaucrats. In the name of atonement, bigger government. The manufacture of phony victims ever since, phony victims, such as females, Hispanics, gays, aleuts, apply for a job and you get the whole list. The manufacture of these, all with the fervent support of the liberals, all granted equal status as victims to the blacks, all to be compensated by more government favors and more government powers, this very manufacture shows that black slavery was not a unique atrocity in the liberal eyes, but merely a convenient means to an end, a tactic, a strategy in a campaign to achieve universal slavery. Now the corollary of the liberal strategy has been the spread of ethnic rivalry and worst of all, an intensifying war between whites and blacks in the form of a vicious circle. White liberals make vicious racial demands allegedly in behalf of blacks. Lesser blacks join in. Whites react angrily. Blacks take the anger as racism and more of them join the black power movement in self-defense. Whites become outraged and decide blacks can't be talked to, etc. Right on through the vicious circle of black youths rebelling in the streets and some selling drugs as the only means of survival in an economically strangled society. And then white police crack down, so blacks cry that they are victims of racism, while whites cry that they are victims of racism. And in fact, everybody is now a victim of racism. That's the system the white professors entrenched to begin with. That's the system they inaugurated on the day when they said that sacrifice is noble and individualism is barbarism. And that is the system that blew up in our faces at the OJ trial. The blacks are not the culprits in this nightmare. They take in all the philosophic poison they hear from the white teachers and the white tenured professors. And then when they get a chance, they fight back, which is what they thought they were doing in the OJ case. In the ethical atmosphere of our time, with altruism and collectivism running wild, Johnny Cochran or any other hired gun with half a brain can easily play the race card and get away with it. It shouldn't be a question in anybody's mind, why did he play the race card? The question should be, who put that card in the deck? And the answer is that that deck was not made in America. It was made in Germany. The defense did not need Mark Furman. O.J. was free anyway. He was free the day the defense turned O.J. from being a rich, genial sports hero, hurt salesman who enjoyed socializing at white country clubs into a capital B black. For black jurors from the inner city to have voted guilty in such a case would have required an act of profound independence. They would have had to defy the tribalism of their entire upbringing and of all their white teachers in order to insist on an individualism and an objectivity which all those same teachers had taught them was impossible and wicked. And this brings me to the epistemological issue in this case. In throwing out the mountain of prosecution evidence, the jurors said they were merely following the law. The law of reasonable doubt. We do not yet live in a world where you can reject reason openly, without any cover-up. Soon, but not yet. Just as philosophers today reject reason allegedly in the name of reason, so ordinary people knowingly or not now reject evidence while claiming to adhere to it. The gimmick here is very important. 
The gimmick is a definition of evidence or reason that makes reason impotent. That way you can invoke reason and evidence all you like and still come to any conclusion that you want. The secret is to accept as reason principles that commit you to nothing. Then you never have to worry that reason will interfere with the passion that is actually ruling you. And here are some of the examples of the concept of reason that govern the OJ trial. See if you can figure out what they have in common and what concept of reason, unacknowledged but actual and operative, was guiding that trial. And you could just plunge in anywhere because it was the same thing over and over, just the concrete's different. Let's jump in with the point where the defense hypothesized a police conspiracy. They didn't say that it actually happened, but merely that it was possible. What proof did they offer that it was possible? They described in some detail an imaginary scenario of an OJ frame-up. And then they said to the prosecutors, in effect, prove that it didn't happen. And to the jury, you see, they can't. So there's reasonable doubt. Now let's just follow this up. If anyone asked why the same policeman, the very same policeman who adored and partied with OJ before the killing, would have ganged up to frame him, the defense provided another imaginary scenario. Namely, and you must have heard this a hundred times on TV, they were sucked into it by Mark Furman, the glove planter, and the better cops are now afraid to speak up. So we go to the next step. On what basis can one say that Furman planted the glove? And the defense's answer, well, it's possible. After all, Furman found the glove, and he boasts on the screenwriter's tape about planning evidence all the time, and he lied about the N-word. Question, but is there any evidence in this case that Furman actually planted anything, or even that he had the opportunity to do so, supposing he had wanted to? Defense answer, a new imaginary scenario. The witnesses underestimated Furman's free time at the crime scene. And besides, they didn't know, as F. Lee Bailey later explained to us all, how Marines learn to carry stuff around inside their socks. It's possible, isn't it? You can't prove it's not, therefore, reasonable doubt. Now, this kind of methodology was repeated over and over. It was the trial. It's not just an example. That was the trial. For instance, you don't like that example? The police did not notice an O.J. blood stain on Nicole Brown's gate on the original inspection. So isn't it possible it was a later plant by a conspirator? And if one blood stain is planted, isn't it possible that others were also? After all, some blood given by O.J. to the police is unaccounted for. At least it's possible that it's unaccounted for because we can imagine that some blood is missing. And if so, isn't it possible that the police stole it and smeared it around? Reasonable doubt. Or the police left some blood samples in a hot truck where one or more might have degenerated to the point where, at the lab, the original DNA would have been undetectable. And these same slides might have accidentally been in contact at the lab with OJ's DNA from other slides so the original sample might have been turned into OJ's by a series of accidents. Why not? It's possible, isn't it? Can you prove it didn't happen? And if it's possible for one drop of the real killer's blood to turn into OJ's blood through police and lab incompetence, how about two drops or 200? So isn't it possible that Mr. X, that's the real killer, not, not OJ, but Mr. X spouted his blood all over the place? And then the police wiped up some of the blood and replaced it with OJ's, while the rest of the blood was accidentally typed as OJ's through incompetence or honest confusion at the labs, so that all of the blood samples at all of the labs ended up converging to the same OG, OJ result, but it was 100% wrong in every case. It's possible, isn't it? Now that is the real question. Is any construct like this possible? Now, if that strikes you as too complicated to follow, you have a simple case, 
out of a movie or a novel that captures all of it. You, if you just hear this one scene, no more of the trial was necessary because I told you everything you, you needed to know. The, of the defense's method of, of argument and their idea of, of being reasonable. And it came, of course, from F. Lee Bailey, a man with the unique distinction of having passed his prime without ever having entered it. <laughs> Bailey, at one point, was suggesting the possibility of two killers working together at the crime scene. Do you remember that? The prosecution pointed out that there was only one set of footprints, to which Bailey, with a straight face, replied, in essence, is it not possible that after the crime, one killer picked up the other and carried them away? <laughs> that is no better or worse than the entire rest of the defense argument. So that the defense's whole approach at this trial was simple. We can hypothesize anything, however groundless. And by the fact that we hypothesize it, it becomes a real possibility to be taken seriously as such. By this approach, any arbitrary assertion, by arbitrary I mean an assertion devoid of evidence, and by this approach, any arbitrary assertion automatically carries reasonable doubt in its favor. And then the defense just has to make a stirring speech about our noble system of justice with its principle of innocent till proven guilty and better let 10 guilty men go free, etc., etc., and then O.J. walks. By the method of the O.J. trial, no case against anyone can be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. No case against anyone. You may as well just cancel all trials completely and acquit everyone, which is what they do in California now, <laughs> but they have the charade of a trial. <clears throat> if you are the least bit imaginative, you can always dream up scenarios that undercut the evidence. It doesn't make any difference how overwhelming it is. Now, last October, for instance, four eyewitnesses in Baltimore testified in court. This is true. I'm not making this up that they saw a black defendant whose name is Davon Neverden. Do you know that case? They, four eyewitnesses testified that they saw him kill a man while attempting a robbery. According to the Wall Street Journal, and I quote, two other people said Neverden had told them he committed the crime. Neverden himself had earlier offered to plead guilty in exchange for a 40-year sentence a deal the prosecutor had rejected at the request of the victim's family. Now, I ask you, is that overwhelming evidence? Four eyewitnesses, two confidants, and a plea bargain for 40 years. The jury, however, including 11 blacks, was unimpressed. And it's not difficult to project their mental process. And it's just Mr. Cochran's. Isn't it possible? Isn't it possible? that the witnesses had misidentified the man, or conspired against him, or been suborned by a hostile white establishment. And if so, if that's possible, reasonable doubt. Now this particular jury observed certain amenities for which you have to give it credit. They deliberated for 11 hours and then they acquitted the defendant. Now I, I challenge you right now, make up a case in pure theory that you regard as being beyond a reasonable doubt. And then in the question period, simply allow me to use the term possible as Johnny Cochran and his team does. I guarantee you that your case will be dead in three minutes, and I strongly invite you to try it and see. Make it absolutely impregnable. 400 witnesses, all of them passed lie detector tests. It'll be wiped out. You don't even have to be imaginative to do it. Now, you have to grasp this distinction between the arbitrary and the possible, which the whole defense case rested on equating. The arbitrary is that for which there is no evidence, none. It is sheer fantasy. The possible, by contrast, if you use the term rationally, means that for which there is some evidence. Not a lot, but some. Enough, actually, to start to establish the truth of the point. One term, arbitrary, denotes a void, 
a zero, an invention outside of cognition. The other belongs to the realm of reason and evidence, and it represents the first point on the continuum of knowledge, which runs from possible to probable to certain. Now let's take an example. You people tonight arrived here three hours ago in a UFO, an unidentified flying object, and you're going home to a Taco Bell on Alpha Delta, <laughs> an as yet undiscovered planet. That is an arbitrary statement. Versus, suppose I look out at you and I say, you people are bored. I see a man squirming over there. There's a few yawns over here. There's people at the back reading the Boston Globe. <laughs> and most of the faces look blank. I can certainly then on that basis claim it's possible. I haven't proved it yet, but I have a grounds on which to say maybe it's true. Now contrast this. You're all sitting here looking intent, focused, responsive. But maybe you're really bored because maybe I paid some objectivist to bribe you with cash into sitting still and looking alert <laughs> so that tonight would seem to be a success. And you're all sitting there furtively fingering the bills and counting the minutes until you can spend the money next month when you visit Las Vegas, which you might do, who knows, People get bribed and go to Las Vegas all the time. It's possible, isn't it? <laughs> now, the point is, it's not possible. The whole construct is arbitrary. The conversion of the arbitrary into the possible is destroying our justice system. But it is not an invention of defense attorneys. On the contrary, groundless maybes now pervade our entire culture, coming from every bad direction, from skeptics, mystics, you name it. How could you be sure of anything? Maybe you've made a mistake. That's the standard skeptic argument. Maybe mathematics contains a contradiction which may show up someday. This is Gödel's celebrated contribution to sanity. Maybe apples are giving us cancer. That's Merle Streep. Maybe, maybe I used to be a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, Shirley MacLaine. <laughs> maybe Jewish bankers are conspiring to destroy the United States. I get this one on the radio regularly in Los Angeles. <laughs> maybe he a heavy industry is destroying the human race. That's the Unabomber. Maybe nobody is here but me, a solipsist. Maybe I'm not here either. That's any professor of philosophy. The maybe people feel no obligation even to pretend to a rational base for their fantasies. Increasingly, you try out this experiment and see if I'm not right. When challenged to cite facts of reality or reasons, they reply, whose facts? Whose reason? Or they say, what's reality to a white isn't necessarily reality to a black. Or what's reality to a Christian isn't necessarily reality to a Jew, etc. Here is what I think the maybe people's real basic philosophy is. Everyone's ideas are subjective. They reflect only some quirk of our body or our consciousness, such as our genes, our ethnicity, or our formative experiences, our psychological makeup, or some other structure over which we have no control. Some structure which rules and distorts our cognition, cutting us off from things as they really are. If so, nothing that we think is objectively true. And at the same time, get this, anything goes. Because anything is possible in the true reality which we can't know. After all, who can limit the unknowable? It follows, therefore, that if there's anything you really want to be true, you have every warrant for believing in it, at least as a possibility. About the unknowable, no one can refute you, not even in theory. So why not hold out for what you want? 
Now, is that not an exact description of the epistemology governing the OJ trial? Would Johnny Cochran or the jury disagree with the following statement? What OJ did that night is something no one but OJ can ever know for sure. Because everyone else's ideas on the subject are affected by his or her experiences, gender, color, etc. The one thing we do know is maybe, maybe in the true reality we can't know OJ is innocent. Maybe he's guilty, yes, but maybe he's innocent. Who can rule out that possibility? And therefore, there's reasonable doubt, etc. Now, a philosophy professor would then take the inevitable next and final step. How can O.J. himself know for sure? <laughs> well, after all, people get confused about what they've done. They misremember. They have delusions of guilt, and so on. Now, I assume you know whose ideas I've been paraphrasing throughout this whole evening from start to finish. One man, the first philosopher ever to hold that reality is unknowable because our mind by its nature is an agent of distortion. The same man, and it's not a coincidence, who was the first to hold that man is radically evil, his words, because we strive by our nature to pursue happiness. The man who ended the age of the Enlightenment vanquished the pursuit of happiness from the philosophic scene and ushered in all the horrors of our time. The man who not only opened, but who built Pandora's box. <laughs> and that, of course, is Immanuel Kant. I did it all, he said, to free man's spirit. Our ignorance of reality, he said, is a blessing in disguise. Because my philosophy, he said, leaves men free to find in reality salvation, God, or whatever else they want. All we have to do is interpret reality by our emotions while thumbing our noses at anyone who tries to refute us. How can he refute us when he is just as ignorant of reality as we are? That was Kant's official program to save religion from science. And thus his boast or I would call it shameful admission, in the critique of pure reason. Quote, I have found it necessary to limit knowledge in order to make room for faith, unquote. That sentence synopsizes the OJ trial. Exactly that sentence out of the critique of pure reason. Now observe the double whammy here, which after many generations of buildup and an increasingly rapid process of corruption, has finally converged into one shattering trial. Kant gave the OJ jurors both motivation and means. His ethics of self-sacrifice led step by step to the collectivist war of all against all, and thus to the jurors' passion for revenge, while his epistemology enabled them to act on this passion with the serenity of an unclouded conscience free to call themselves reasonable every step of the way. What a setup today's juries are for an unscrupulous defense attorney. I hope that that term is not yet a redundancy. By an unscrupulous defense attorney, I mean one who rationalizes that his job is to get the client off, period. In an adversarial system, he explains, it's not his role to know or fight for the truth. That's up to the jury, whom he then proceeds to emasculate with the siren song of maybe. I hope you'll ask me in the question period about my view of a proper defense attorney. I just want to say here categorically that I reject the idea, I reject the idea, that everyone is born with the right to an attorney paid for by the government. And I reject still more vehemently the idea that it is the moral function of a lawyer to get his client off while remaining agnostic about the client's guilt or innocence, or still worse, while knowing full well that he is guilty. On these issues, the horrible, horrible example, in my opinion, is Alan Dershowitz, who wrote the following in 82 and still preaches it today, a brief quote from one of his books. A criminal trial, quote, a criminal trial is anything but a pure search for truth. When defense attorneys represent guilty clients, as most do most of the time, 
Their responsibility is to try by all fair and ethical means to prevent the truth about their client's guilt from emerging, unquote. Now, I submit that if trials still have anything to do with the category or concept of justice, then it is a contradiction in terms to speak of an ethical means to prevent the truth about a guilty man from emerging. And I would be happy to answer and elaborate that in the question group. Now a remark about Judge Ito. At two points that I saw, which were exceptions to the rest of the trial and to our Kantian culture, he did function as a rational judge and ruled the arbitrary out of court. The best known of these was when the defense wanted to bring up the theory that the murders were the work of Colombian drug dealers. And the judge had the courage, and today it takes courage, to say that since this was a groundless hypothesis, it couldn't be presented to the jury. So Judge Ito, judging on that example, has a remnant of a better epistemology, but only a remnant. In my opinion, the main reason for Judge Ito's widely noted ineffectuality was his repeated defaults in regard to the arbitrary. Once the maybe lawyers set the terms of a trial, then there is no longer any objective criterion of evidence or even of relevance. Such a trial becomes an endless talk fest with the judge as toothless master of ceremonies. No matter what he had done, however, Judge Ito was caught by our Kantian culture. If he had methodically barred the arbitrary, as he should have, the OJ people would have screamed that he was being unfair, biased, one-sided. And how could he have answered them? Remember that in a Kantian culture, fairness has nothing to do with objectivity. Since no one can know the objective facts anyway, according to today's consensus, a fair hearing is not one in which only objectively proved facts are allowed in by the judge. On the contrary, it's one in which both sides get to say their piece, more or less, whatever it is. In a subjectivist world, as we hear regularly, everybody has a right to his opinion. Logic notwithstanding, a court run by objective rules would literally silence an arbitrary defense. And in the O.J. case, with the mountain of prosecution evidence, it would have left Johnny Cochran virtually speechless. And that, in turn, would have been regarded on its face by the O.J. mobs and the press and the law professors as being a perversion of justice. In a racially sensitive and heavily publicized case like this one, the judge, if he wants to seem fair to all parties, fair in today's sense of the term, must more or less divvy up his rulings in egalitarian fashion, a couple for you and a couple for you, while letting the lawyers do more or less whatever they want, which is just what happened. Now a word about the prosecution. It should be apparent that I was on the side of Marsha Clark and Christopher Darden throughout the trial. I believe they did what was possible given what our legal system has become. The only thing I can suggest from a philosophic viewpoint is that after Marsha Clark alluded to the issue of arbitrary possibilities, which she actually did do in her opening statement. She should have kept hammering at that point. Above all, the prosecution should not have gone on the defensive as they did. In other words, they should not have spent their time trying to refute Johnny Cochran's arbitrary hypotheses. That was their fatal mistake. Because if they ever had had a chance, they lost it by that method. There's just one example. Here again, every, anywhere in the trial is, is another example. At one point, the prosecution tried to argue that too many policemen would have been needed to carry out a conspiracy, that a plot that huge is impossible, which left it open for the defense to consume hours in and out of court, arguing that the number of conspirators required is really not that big. Now, the implicit premise of even holding such a discussion is that the plot is possible and that the two sides disagree merely on details. And to give you my earlier example applied in this instance, it was be as though 
I started arguing, well, it's impossible for all you hundreds of people to get into a single UFO. And then the comeback would come by, UFOs are a lot roomier than you realize <laughs> because all the occupants are temporarily miniaturized. <laughs> now you, you take it from there, argument and counter-argument into infinity, all of it ending up nowhere except with me conceding by implication that UFOs are possible and thus losing the whole case, losing it by the sheer fact of agreeing to enter an argument about details within the framework of the arbitrary. The fact is that no one can refute an arbitrary statement. You can't prove a negative. So on the basis of their performance, I have to conclude that the prosecution, like the rest of the court, did not fully understand the issue and that they too succumbed despite their best intentions to major elements of the Kantian approach. Their attempted refutations of the defense's maybes were futile and merely worked to legitimize the defense's irrationality. Now of all the commentary that I saw on the OJ case, the best by far was a column in a publication called Investors Business Daily by Paul Sperry, dated October 9, 1995, entitled, Renaissance Lost? Question mark. Here's a few brief excerpts. Quote, not enough evidence, too much evidence, contaminated evidence. These are some of the reasons that O.J. Simpson was set free. But something is wrong here, and it's not the evidence. Rather, it's how we look at it. We're losing faith in cold, hard facts and our power to reason, and the rebellion against logic is not limited to L.A. jurors. And then again, later in the article, quote, there is doubt, and then there is reasonable doubt. It's not reasonable to doubt absolute truths like DNA in light of the defense's contradictory theories, but the jury did, unquote. And what will happen to us if, as Mr. Sperry puts it in a really eloquent phrase, if our, quote, if our jurors continue to not know how to know. And here is one answer that he offers. If our jurors continue to not know how to know. Quote, some experts posit that the nation is slowly slipping back to a dark age mentality, reversing the scientific thought process that's been crystallizing since the Renaissance, unquote. I don't know who his experts are, but they certainly have convinced me. As I see it, the nation is in a terrible quandary. If the authorities do nothing in the post-OJ period, the legal system will gradually, it's already becoming an object of unambiguous disgust in the public mind. But, if the authorities do something other than correct the underlying epistemology, what are they going to do? The scary possibility is that conservatives will introduce so-called reforms to make it easier to get convictions, regardless of whether they are thereby jeopardizing truly innocent people's rights. And the result will be, if and when the fascist mind had come to power, that they will find a legal system already shaped to provide the kind of outcomes they want. You know, automatic rubber stamping of whoever you, the prosecution decides to, to uh, indict. The only solution, I tell you this every year in April, so I have to do it again, the only solution is philosophy. But who will take up and implement that solution? If no one does, I, I see a bleak future for the criminal justice system for race relations and for the, for the nation. And that's why I believe that the O.J. acquittal, along with its causes, is a very ugly and frightening turning point. Here we have the spectacle of a whole nation being told openly and daily, in defiance of all facts and logic, that two and two is five, and that if you don't agree, you are a racist. Now, in particular, this case is a disaster for, be, for, uh, for blacks who are being pushed by the left into a race war which will be lethal for them. The only hope for blacks, for whites, for the United States is to start afresh with Aristotle, not Kant, as 
our guide. Aristotle was the original founding father, and his philosophy is the only path to racial amity, to justice, and to a human future. People say that where there's life, there's hope. I hope so. Thank you. As most of you know, it is time for a question period, and Dr. Peikoff will uh, take your questions if you uh, will come to the microphones on either of the two aisles. Uh, please do not touch either of the microphones because we are recording, and somehow that will interfere with the recording process, but I will uh, call you alternatively from either side of the, of the uh, auditorium. Uh, you first. Good evening, my name is Saskia Wilhelms, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. I also studied philosophy and what I wonder about, first of all, thank you for your lecture. Thanks for your lecture. But um, if we can solve so many problems of life and of society with philosophy, first of all, who determines that objectivism is the right philosophy to apply to our problems? Second, if we assume that we apply objectivism, how do you know that the way you see reality, or the one reality as you perceive it, is the correct reality? My second comment is... Um, that's, to that's only one comment so far, okay? Yes, okay. and my second, that yeah. is the larger one, okay. because it's important for yeah. our society yeah. overall. My second comment is specifically to the legal system. If you dispute the right of any defendant to have lawyers paid for by the state, by us, the taxpayers, um, you will get exactly the O.J. Simpson effect, but even in a worse aggravation, because then it's only the poor defenders who will go to jail, but not the rich ones. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I could answer you briefly, which I'll have to, because the answer would be a whole volume, because you and I disagree on epistemology and on ethics at the root. So I just have to point out to you, on your first question, you are thoroughly Kantian in the implication of your question. So you're a child of your time. You are saying, who determines what is the correct philosophy and whether it corresponds to the correct reality, to, to reality as it really is? Nobody determines. Anybody determines who is able to use his cognitive faculties. The cognitive faculties are your senses, and then rational inference therefrom. I regard philosophy as being a science, exactly as mathematics or physics. You don't say who determines how much two and two is. You don't take a poll, and you don't have an authority. You have an objective methodology of addition, and you start off with certain axioms, and you apply it. And philosophy has to be, not concretely in terms of the de deductive method, but in essence, as completely objective, it's not a matter of personalities. Everybody, I would say, perceives, perceives. You're talking about the senses, reality, correctly. I don't ascribe even any meaning to the term perceives reality incorrectly. If he perceives something that is there, then he perceives it. He perceives it in a form governed by his senses. That doesn't distort the facts. You have to perceive it somehow but you can't perceive what isn't there. That's a hallucination, it's not a form of perception, and there are ways of distinguishing that from perception. So the percepts, I say, of everybody are automatic and completely 100% reliable. They reveal reality as it is. All argument comes in on the basis of how we conceptualize our percepts, and there we have to have worked out, that's what epistemology is for, and ask me who works it out. Exactly the same person who worked out the rules of addition. Anybody that can prove his case step by step using logic. Who certifies it? Your mind using logic. That's the only answer that there can be. There is no authority, there is no polls. Is it possible? I say it is. If you say it isn't, you put yourself back to being a Kantian or a skeptic. 
You can't know anything. You can't even consistently know that you have doubts because maybe, you know, that whole thing about reducing skeptics to babbling, how do you know? You, I'm not certain that I'm not certain that I'm not certain that I'm not certain. Are you certain of that? No, I'm not certain. And you add one more. You know, as the ancients used to call it reduction of the skeptic to babbling. So who determines the answer is you using your reason objectively. As to the question of uh, defendant, let me say that one of the nice things about being rich is that you're able to get m many more benefits than being poor. That's why people want to be rich. <laughs> if you are rich, you get much better groceries, you get much better tables at restaurants, you get much better medical attention, much better schooling. The whole idea of working and earning money is that you can then spend it to get the best that other people have to offer. If you have no money and you want their services, you're at their mercy and you have to depend upon their charity. Certainly you're not going to have the kind of lawyer that a millionaire can afford. That's one of the reasons why you should not be poor. You should work for a living. And if you had a free country where you know there were economic opportunities where they didn't, siphon off all of the cash that people make and plow it into welfare schemes and therefore leave everybody bankrupt. But in a free country, you use the money, the opportunities that are there to earn money, and you have to be satisfied with the best that you can afford or you can depend upon charity. Now, what I think the legal system should have is a provision in a proper society that if a defendant is absolutely broken, he can't raise a nickel, the judge should have to march him through the form, you know, one step at a time and say, tell him, you know, you could call a witness now or you can, you know, petition so-and-so in a simplified way. But one of the prices the man has to pay is he does not have the money to afford someone to give their talent to defend him. That's exactly the same in any and every field. And the fact that it's the legal system doesn't change it, in my opinion. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Dr. Pukoff, uh, on one of your radio shows, you had mentioned that uh, you didn't like the movie Forrest Gump, and I was curious on the reasons for that. Well, I, gave, I did a couple of shows on Forrest Gump. I thought the movie Forrest Gump was ambiguous. It could have been taken, in certain respects, as a satire on life in America today, but it was, I thought, a very consistent attack on intelligence. They portrayed Forrest Gump as having every good quality. He was faithful and loyal and true and good-hearted and all the rest of it, except he was adult. He was mentally retarded. And continuously throughout the movie, uh, he kept behaving in ways that amply bore that out, you know, like walking back and forth across the continent. I don't know how many times uh, to overcome one tragedy. And he, he, everything that he... Uh, succeeded at, he succeeded by sheer accident because there was a typhoon or whatever. And so the net result of the movie was the message that the smart people are the enemy, the slick ones who control the system, and the only ones with a good heart are the ones uh, without any brains. It was really a Russian movie. I mean that in the sense of the Russian sense of life. You know what Dostoevsky called the idiot, the, the, the novel The Idiot? was based on the Russian idea that brains are the enemy of God and that if you want man in his pure sense that unites him to the true spiritual presence that rules the universe, you have to get rid of his brains. So in Russia, they venerate idiots as being truer or closer to God. And Forrest Gump was simply medieval Russian sense of life presented as a modern American movie. Uh, Dr. Peikoff, thank you very much for your lecture. Thank you. Um, on a lighthearted note, I'd like to ask you your opinion of the mad cow disease epidemic from a philosophical point of view. Uh, well, philosophers, uh, I don't know, have any division of any of their uh, branches that studies mad cows. <laughs> I have heard that there was needless hysteria with regard to it, but I did not investigate that case. I will say, however, that the most insane thing that I heard about that case was from the British head of the 
equivalent of the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, who said that the only humanitarian, or bovine, I guess, solution uh, would be if every person in Britain would adopt one mad cow and keep it as a pet. Thank you. That's my contribution on that subject. I disagree with his suggestion. Yeah. I'd like to say first that I think this was a good talk, an important talk, and I think you've illustrated well the danger of skepticism to society. Um, and so I'd like to ask you to back up a claim that you've made. I don't want this back to... Back up? A claim that you've made. Yes, go ahead. Uh, skepticism has been around for a very long time. Yeah. It seems to me that it's, it's easy to believe in. It's been shrouded in the mantle of sophistication, in some sense, by a lot of people beyond Kant, maybe not even Kant. So in what sense is the epistemology of maybe, skepticism, his fault? Why is he the cause? That's a very good question. And it has a very simple answer. Skepticism has been around since way back near the beginning of Greek philosophy. But if you will observe, skepticism always marked, if you follow the cycles of the history of philosophy, it's like, you know, boom and then bust, and boom and then bust, and periodically there would be these busts, which are the equivalent of philosophic collapse, and that was a period of skepticism. But it never lasted, certainly never lasted generations, let alone centuries, because the preceding skeptics only said, we can't know anything. And they picked on the senses or so, you know, they had various arguments like the possibility of error and so on, but their whole concern was simply to say, we are barred from knowing anything. And so they just gave up and no one could function uh, on that basis. So therefore, and other philosophers would come in to try a new construction. The perfect example of this uh, in the ancient world was the, the follower of Heraclitus, uh, a, a, a skeptic, who stopped talking, Cratylus, that's his name, on the ground that uh, you, you could, the world was changing so fast we couldn't know anything, and by the time I said the table, the table would be gone, in the flux, so he'd simply stop talking. You couldn't know anything, so he was completely paralyzed. Another example is David Hume, who said that you have to forget your philosophy when you leave the table, because you, otherwise you simply couldn't get up or function at all. And that's why skepticism never lasted. Now, Kant was the one who made skepticism endure, because he said that is the foundation for a whole way of life and that was the idea of dividing us into two realities. Another reality that can be whatever we want, and this world, which, we, which is not reality, but which we can cope with. And therefore, he gave the idea, go ahead, go along with science. You can understand, you know, you can build your inventions and so on. You don't, don't have to be a skeptic who writes off anything, everything. But on the other hand, it, true reality is always this unknowable, which uh, can be whatever our hearts want it to be. And that was, therefore, science had its domain, and uh, faith, religion, the heart, whatever you call it, had its domain. And it was on that basis that he gave people the illusion that you could carry on science with skepticism at the same time, because you were learning something about an inferior, unreal world. Uh, it's not true. But nevertheless, the illusion persists. It would be wonderful if the skeptics today were like the old skeptics and stopped talking, stopped moving, <laughs> threw up their hands and said, why go to school? Nobody can know anything. But instead of that, they say you can't know anything, and then they become experts in writing journals about what nobody can know. So uh, uh, it's completely corrupt philosophically today, and it's Kant that gave it that lease on life. Um, first, I wanted to thank you for coming again tonight. I always enjoy your lectures. Uh, I wanted to take you. you up on your offer to yeah. discuss what you consider the appropriate role of defense attorneys. Oh, sure. I just happen to have a page of notes. <laughs> <laughs> I do not believe that the uh, adversary system is an excuse for becoming a hired gun. I don't believe that the way that justice uh, prevails is to have a blind prosecution trying to convict 
and pulling out all stops to do so against a blind defender trying to acquit and pulling all stops out. I don't think that justice emerges from the methodical clash of two wrong-headed injustices. Or put it another way, specialization of labor does not mean abdication of conscience. You would never solve questions in any other field by that method. Imagine you wanted to try to resolve uh, um, a political dispute. What type of political system to have? So you t gave one guy, told him, you bone up on all the arguments for capitalism. It doesn't make any difference whether you believe it or you don't believe it. And you just become a hired gun. Memorize all the answers, all the tricks of evasion, etc. And you do the same over here for communism. And then just go at each other. Your own convictions are irrelevant. You're just, your responsibility is make as good a case however screwed up it is. And then the public will decide on the basis of the two of you interacting, the public being the stand-in for the judge. There will be no possible thing at stake in such a thing except who has the best debating skills, which have no correlation with, with truth or justice. And that is what has happened in the adversary system. Now, you ask me what I think it should be. I think, first of all, you have the responsibility. If you are using your mind in a profession to use it in the name of rational values, you have no business going into law, into criminal law, if justice is not your overriding value. That's number one. And you, if justice is your overriding value, you have the responsibility whether you're the defendant or a lawyer or not, you have the responsibility, first of all, to decide in your mind, is this person innocent or guilty? I do not think you have the moral right to say, I will use my talent promiscuously. I will use it in, regardless of whether the man is innocent or guilty. I don't know and I don't care. I think it's every man's prerogative to judge who he deals with. And that you should cast the first stone, whether you're a defense attorney or not. But if you are, your professional life is to use your skills and your knowledge and your resources to defend a man against a charge, you have the moral obligation to decide. There's no use telling you that's the jury's function. That's the jury's function to make the legal decision on which the state will act. But for you to participate in that morally, I say you first of all have to know in your own mind. And then the following possibilities exist. You think he's guilty. Then your choice morally, and then you ask my opinion, is you uh, try uh, claim at the outset that in your opinion he is guilty and all you're struggling for is a mitigated sentence if you think that that's warranted. You want to bring into account circumstances that would ease uh, the penalty. Or you withdraw from the case on the grounds that the defendant wants someone to defend him and you don't believe he is defensible. Now then you say to me, what about if, you know, leaving aside the issue of money, which I've talked about, what if every criminal lawyer in the country interviews this guy and they all come away saying he is guilty and the client won't plead guilty and their conscience and the best they can judge, they're all in that position. I say that criminal's in a really bad shape. It's just tough on him. It has to mean that the evidence is so overwhelming in the judgment of the defense attorneys that uh, uh, he, there's no possible way for a reasonable person to believe that he has a, a, an out. I don't think that's bad. I think it's good. If the evidence is that clear cut, then it should revert back down to a simple statement that the court will follow the guy through the procedure, will monitor the steps and tell him in layman's language what he can say and do when, uh, and that's it. He, th that's his problem if he got himself into a situation where nobody will, uh, who is honest will defend him. And that is not a failure of the system. That is the active responsibility by the participants as their primary concern being justice, not, quote, the adversarial interplay. Now, if a lawyer is uncertain after he's investigated, then I say fine. If he thinks there's an actual basis, a basis for saying it's possible this guy is innocent, then that's the real case where you need a criminal defense attorney to stress the exonerating evidence, the, the exculpating evidence, the, the evidence 
which if a reasonable person saw it would say, you know, it's possible he didn't do it. That, I think, is really the primary function of a defense attorney. Not to get the guilty off, but to bring out real possibilities if they really uh, exist. Uh, uh, and of course, if you think he's innocent, then there's no conflict. But I consider that it's completely immoral to say, this man is guilty. He, he just wiped out this whole family. He shot them down in cold blood. But it's not my responsibility to decide. I'm going to take the skills that I have acquired, the talents in my mind, and use it. I won't lie to the court. I'll just shade and hedge and conf confuse and subvert and twist and, you know, etc. until I catch them in enough technicalities so that an ignorant enough jury gets befuddled enough to let the guy off. I think that is a moral scandal that someone would do it on the sly, let alone that they would preach at Harvard Law School that that is your official moral function. So. Yes. Could you comment on the concept of jury sequestration and whether, if ever, it's valid? And also, how would juries be selected and the whole process be conducted of choosing juries in the context of a free society? Well, that is a really specialized legal philosophy, a question out of legal philosophy, which I don't specialize in. I uh, uh, do not think, first of all, that there should be any quota systems applied anywhere, including to jury selection. And I am very suspicious, but I'm speaking here, so to speak, off the cuff because this is not part of my field as uh, being in philosophy. I'm very suspicious about the idea of letting the, the attorneys uh, do all the uh, juror uh, investigation because they try to get off anybody who's unfavorable to their case. I have heard of systems where you have a huge pool where the judge goes through and tries to determine is there anybody to be um, you know challenged for cause you know anybody who knows the defendant or who's prejudiced on the issues involved etc and once the, the judge uh, i'm not saying i advocate this but this sounds plausible to me without investigation once the judge pronounces let us say these 200 people as being unremovable for cause they just then do it by lottery they just pick out the first uh, 12 names, and then the 12 alternates. Now, I don't say that's the only way, but I think there has to be some kind of a, a method of removing jury selection, especially once it gets to the point where there are experts hired by the lawyers to pick out which jurors are going to be favorable and unfavorable. Uh, I mean, it, it's a farce. The technique has eaten up the process. And there's no longer any concern for justice. Actually, I meant deeper than that. I meant on a political level because today you're sort of mandated that you have to have to serve at some point it, you know if you had a truly f oh oh you mean do oh you mean i give that whole speech for nothing no no i <laughs> it's like if I could go to the next it's like the kid who says where did where did i come from and the parent gives the whole lecture he says oh i just wondered because my friend came from chicago <laughs> no 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 i'm i I'm so is that basically, you, you were asking, is the subpoena valid yeah, in a proper system? Oh. I'm well, sorry. Maybe I could save the answer and replay it next year. Okay. Uh, I think a subpoena is definitely valid if there's grounds to believe that you have evidence in a case. Actual selection of jurors is a different question because there's a question whether or not there should be professional jurors That's what I mean. who get decently paid, volunteer, and that is their career. Uh, there's a lot to be said for that. I have never heard a compelling argument for jury, uh, for, for, for forcing a person onto a jury. And the way the system works right now is that only the unemployed or people who are delighted to miss their job uh, go onto the jury so you get the lowest, you know, mentalities possible. Dr. Peikoff, at the end of your talk, you said um, that the solution is a rational philosophy, and you ended with the question, who will implement that philosophy? Could you expound on that a bit? Well, uh, implement means apply in practice, bring into reality. And there are many stages that, to implement a philosophy, and it takes a long period of time. It's not just one person. 
You have to start with the one person, whether it was Jesus in regard to Christianity or Karl Marx, if you take him as the source with regard to communism, and they put out the basic ideas, the manifesto. And then they have to have a whole, generations of followers who will apply that in all the different fields. Usually it starts in the arts, uh, in uh, the public press or the public form of communication, whatever it is, in, above all in the teaching professions, in the schools and in the colleges. The ideas have to filter down until finally from one you have ten and you have a thousand and then you have key representatives in, in all the different intellectual professions. And then, finally, you start turning out generations who consider this a possibility. And then, finally, you know, uh, they're able to start applying it in their daily life. And then the questions, then you have a rational context to, to, to start then having a political change. But politicians by themselves cannot change the political system we live in. Politicians are part of the same education. They hold the same ideas as everybody else. And it's ridiculous to take part in this you know, automatic reflex of denouncing all politicians because they come from the same place that everybody else comes from. So the, the only way is not to expect, you can't expect the people in Washington to change the system. All you can expect is that maybe they'll buy us enough time that we can educate enough people, spread the word in the way it has to be done slowly and gradually, but there is no I wish there was one person that could, quote, implement uh, a whole system, but when you have a whole Western civilization going to the dogs, uh, is, one person can't even put a finger in the dike. All he can do is draw a map on where the finger should go, and then the next generation, and the next, and then finally you drag somebody and he gets there if the flood hasn't come through. Thank you. Just so that you'll know, I'm only going to be able to take one more question from each aisle. Uh, well, I never got the challenge. And I just say I never got the unanswerable case beyond, uh, that the person is guilty beyond you a have, reasonable doubt. You have doubt. two more opportunities. Okay. Do Dr. Peikoff, what about the contributions of the civil rights movement to our today's present racial mess, like in terms of like black um, racism and um, silence on depredations of many in the black community. I can't hear you too clearly. What about the... What about the contributions of the civil rights movement to today's racial mess, including the phenomenon of black racism and the um, silence concerning the many depredations in the black community? Well, I mean, the civil rights movement was a, was a mixed situation insofar as they were fighting legal segregation uh, or government uh, discrimination, I think that was perfectly justified. But I don't believe that they're justified in fighting private discrimination. I think the only way of fighting private discrimination is by the market, by the fact that in a free country, people who discriminate against someone on the ground of race deprive themselves of a whole potential of talent from that race that goes to their competitors. And therefore they end up uh, on the losing side across time. Uh, so I think the civil rights movement dominantly was, was leftist and statist the way almost all movements have been in the last decades. And they've certainly contributed uh, to the race war. Uh, and in, I think affirmative action is one of those cases. I don't think that the solution to past discrimination is reverse discrimination or reverse racism. I think it's individualism. But, but that is, uh, is not even considered now. It's just a question of whose group you are going to belong to and whose group is going to wield the club in Washington for the next span of time. I enjoyed your lecture. Dr. Pikov, thank yeah. you very much for another wonderful intellectual experience. And I have two brief questions. You have two. Okay. Uh, 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 first, in, in an era where there are so many judicial outrages almost daily, why does the O.J. Simpson case stand out as a sign of the times? And second, on the basis of your analysis, how would you evaluate the conduct of Chief Prose Prosecutor Garcetti? Wow. Okay, you know, I had a section on Garcetti in the speech and I took it out because I didn't think it was really philosophical enough. Uh, let's take your two questions briefly in order. 
The reason that everybody, not just me, is taking the OJ case as a symbol is we finally saw the whole thing from beginning to end. Most of the case, like the Menendai brothers and you know, so on, you, uh, you just get snippets and headlines and you assume, you assume something more rational is going on, but you just don't see it. But here was a case drawn out from day one. And the evidence, uh, people that I respect within the legal profession have said that there has never been that convincing a case uh, uh, in, in this type of crime that, that they can remember in the annals of... of so uh, it, it's not as though, you know, it, uh, this case isn't eloquent. We know every detail, and it was a total mountain of evidence. And uh, it's for that reason that the perversion of justice stands out as being so screamingly, there's no other way around it. There's no ambiguities that could account for it. There's no hidden things. We knew every, every illicit love affair that every sub alternate juror had was covered. So <laughs> we all were world authorities on this. Uh, as to Mr. Garcetti, I think he's horrible. Uh, as far as I can understand, he was micromanaging the case uh, behind the scenes. He is the one who ensured that O.J. would be acquitted by virtue of holding the trial in downtown L.A. when uh, the com crime was committed in Santa Monica where he would have had a white jury. But he was afraid of a riot if O.J. was convicted. And uh, his motivation was move the trial to downtown L.A. so that there'll be a black jury. And then if they convict, it's the blacks convicting a black so there'll be no grounds for a riot. And things have reached the stage in L.A. of such fear since the rioters are never punished for what they do and they just run wild and the police just stay home. And the police have to do that now because otherwise they're accused of racism and police brutality. There is such fear of, of fomenting racial trouble that uh, uh, they, would ra they made a conscious decision that they'd rather let O.J. walk than have another riot. When you can just imagine what state justice is in in California now where they make decisions on that basis, to say nothing of the fact that Mr. Garcetti knew, just to take a detail, uh, Furman's employment record, knew that the man was a racist. He knew that he was going to go on the stand and perjure himself repeatedly and authorized it. So he obviously is a, a guilt-ridden, liberal pragmatist, I can get away with the type, and if you ever see him on the screen, that just screams out, not from his mouth, but from his face. So he, he, he I think, is awful, uh, and the only good thing is that we were spared having to look at him. We got to look at Marsha instead. <laughs> That's my, uh, I hope that he'll be defeated for DA of LA in the, in the fall. Thank if you. I, if I could have just a moment to make an announcement, we're actually two announcements. One, I would ask you to please join us for our next program at the Ford Hall Forum. On April 28th, former CIA Director Robert Gates will be here at the Blackman Auditorium to discuss the secrets of the Cold War. Number two, Dr. Peacock will be signing books in the Frost Lounge after the lecture. And number three, I would hope you would join me in thanking him for coming again.